In the conceptual videos, you guys learned that when you have a loop of wire or a coil of wire and you change the magnetic field through it, you're going to induce a current in that loop. Uh, more specifically, you're actually inducing a voltage which then produces that current. To get mathematical with it, we're going to, use, we're going to learn about something called Faraday's Law of Induction. And Michael Faraday came up with this relationship for us and it says that the voltage that's induced, now you notice that doesn't look like a V from before, but the epsilon actually stands for EMF, electromotive force, which is uh, specific to induction. But it, at the end of the day, it's a voltage and it has the units of volts. But that induced voltage is proportional to the number of loops, the change in something called the magnetic flux, and a little b for magnetic, over time. So the more loops you have, the more you change the flux, and in the least amount of time, uh, we'll give you the biggest voltage. And uh, we're going to go into the specifics of this in a second. The first thing we have to do is talk about this magnetic flux business that's new to us. And the magnetic flux, in a sense, is a measure of the amount of field strength through the loop. But it also depends on the size or area of the loop. So the flux is the magnetic field strength times the size of the loop, and then with this cosine of the angle in here. Now what's the angle we're talking about? Well if I have a loop like this, we define the direction of the loop as a line that is normal to the plane of the loop. So that would actually be the direction of the area of the loop. If I had magnetic field lines going through the loop and they were parallel to that normal line, which is, that looks roughly parallel, the angle between them would be zero and the cosine of zero is one. So in other words, you get your maximum flux when the field lines are perpendicular to the plane of the loop or parallel to this normal line in the loop. When, if, the, if you were to rotate this loop so 90 degrees, you would get no flux at all. And the way I, I think of that is if I rotate it 90 degrees, the lines couldn't pass through the loop. They would be in the same plane as the loop and they couldn't pass through the loop, so that's why there's no flux. What that means is that we can go back here and complicate this equation a little bit, but it make it more practical to use and say that it's minus n, the number of loops, times the change in the flux, which is b times a times cosine of theta over time. Something I should explain here is that it's the change in the flux. Now, if you notice, there's three terms in here. You've got the magnetic field strength, the area, and the cosine of the angle. We can change the flux by changing any of these things. I can change the magnetic field strength. For instance, if I had a loop over here and I had a magnet, if I brought the magnet closer to the loop, that would increase the strength of the B field in the loop because the closer you are to the magnet, the stronger the B field is. So by moving a magnet closer to this loop or, or actually further away from the loop, I would be changing the magnetic field and I would induce a voltage. If I were to change the area, in other words, I were somehow, if this was a flexible wire, I were to grab it and pull it shut so there was no area, that would change the field too. And we're gonna look at another application of that later and see how that works. And then there you've got the cosine of the angle. So if I change the angle, I will change the flux. Uh, a very practical example of that is a generator. I have a loop of wire, and if I rotate it in a magnetic field, I'm, I'm changing the angle. And by changing the angle, I'm changing the flux and inducing a voltage. Let's do a, uh, a, just a practical example of this really quickly. A square coil of wire with sides L equals five centimeters contains 100 loops and is positioned perpendicular to a uniform 0 0.600 Tesla magnetic field. It's quickly pulled from the field at a constant speed in a time of 0 0.100 seconds. The coil's total resistance is 100 ohms. Find A, the rate of change of flux through the coil, and B, the EMF and induced current. All right, let's take a look at this. Okay, so I'm gonna draw a picture here. Now, the coil is inside a magnetic field contains a magnetic field and it's going to go from a place of having a magnetic field inside to a place where it has no magnetic field. So the before and after is what you might think of as maximum flux and zero flux because if there's no magnetic field inside the loop, there's no flux. The rate of change of flux is going to be the change in flux over the time interval. Our final flux is zero. So we're gonna write that as zero minus the initial flux. Now these things are at a right angle to one another. 
so I, when I say that, I mean the plane of the loop and the magnetic field lines, which means we can get rid of the cosine. That's just cosine of zero, which is one. So this is going to be zero minus b times a over t. And that's going to be zero minus 0 0.600 Tesla times an area of 0 0.05 meters squared. And if you're wondering where that came from, 0 0.05 is five centimeters and it's a square, so we just square it. And all this divided by a time of 0 0.100 seconds. And that is going to come out to 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2 Weber's per second. Now, mind you, I, I didn't mention the unit for magnetic flux is the Weber. So that's the rate of change in flux. Now, there is a minus sign out front because we were subtracting that. And we'll talk about these minus signs a little bit later. It's not something we need to address right now. And then B, we want to find the EMF. Okay, well, the EMF is minus N times the rate and change of flux through our loop. Well, we already kind of found the rate of change of flux, so we basically just have to take minus n, which in our case is 100, times our answer up here, which makes it 1.5 volts. Now the current, going back to Ohm's law, is voltage over resistance. So I have 1.5 volts divided by 100 ohms, and we have 0 0.015 amperes. Remember how I said we were going to talk about the negative sign that occurs in this equation? That's This is the time. That negative sign, oh, I could get so f deep with this, but I'm not going to. It helps us determine the direction of the current. The current's either going to be clockwise or counterclockwise in this loop. This negative sign, if you want to get fancy, is known as Lenz's law. The negative sign basically tells us that nature would like to maintain a constant flux in the loop. If I have flux in my loop and I pull it to a place where there is no flux, nature is going to try to induce a current that will maintain the flux. Remember, if we move current, we make a magnetic field. If we move it in a loop, we use a right-hand rule to find the direction of that current. We curl our fingers in the direction of the current and our thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. If I'm losing my flux like I would be going from here to here, the induced current will be in such a direction to reinforce the magnetic field that's already there, to try to maintain that. If I'm losing flux, I point my thumb in the direction of the current magnetic field, and my fingers will be pointing in the direction of my induced current. So in this case, I'd point my thumb into the page, and I would notice that my fingers curl in a clockwise direction. And that's Lenz's law. If we were going the opposite, if I was going from a place of no flux and trying to go into the magnetic field, well, nature wants me to have no flux if I already have no flux. And so I would try to oppose that magnetic field by creating a new magnetic field in the opposite direction. And I would point my thumb away from these lines, which would be out of the page, and that would make my fingers curl in a counterclockwise direction. So that's how you use Lenz's law. And I'm gonna very briefly abbreviate it and say that when the change in flux is negative, then, in other words, you're losing flux, thumb with B field. Okay, so we're going to put our thumb in the direction of the existing B field. When the change in flux is positive, in other words, I'm increasing the flux, thumb to be against B field. And we will see more practical examples of that in the next video.